Thanks everyone for joining us. It looks like most of the participants that I can see uh, have entered the room. We'll see a few people, a few more people uh, coming in as we, as we go forward. Uh, our discussion today, as you know, is about Russia's invasion and Ukrainian refugees. Uh, we're offering global comparisons and discussing Canada's role. The event, as you know, is sponsored by the Petra Yatsik Program for the Study of Ukraine, and the co-sponsors are the Global Migration Lab at the Monk School and also the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, also at the Monk School. Um, I'm Ed Schatz um, at uh, SARIS, Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. I'll be chairing our session today. Some 100 or maybe 110 years ago, the Russian Empire was the site of a series of cataclysmic events that sent waves of refugees westward. Uh, my grandparents were among them, uh, fleeing the Odessa and Vinitsa regions before crossing the border into what uh, today is Moldova and then eventually migrating to North America. Today, we see a similar flow of bodies, some fleeing to Moldova, others to Poland, smaller numbers to other states uh, unfolding before our very eyes. And to date, if I'm not mistaken, the panelists can correct me, um, almost 2 million people have, uh, are estimated to have, to have fled. And the US State Department projects that we can expect 5 million uh, to leave uh, Ukraine, whether temporarily or permanently. These are deeply unsettling events, of course, primarily for those directly affected, but also for those of us trying to make sense of them from a greater distance. Today we have um, an all-star panel um, ready to make sense of these rapidly changing developments. Each of them will speak for about 10 minutes. I've warned them that uh, I'm a ruthless timekeeper, um, so we'll try to keep them, uh, keep them honest that way. And I'll also keep my introduction short because I think uh, you're all quite capable of getting fuller information about our distinguished speakers uh, as you see fit. But very briefly, three speakers today, and we'll go in this order. Uh, first, we'll have Randall Hansen, who's the director of the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, and the director of the Global Migration Lab, both at the Monk School. He's also Canada Research Chair in Global Migration and Professor of Political Science at UFT. Second, we'll turn to Lama Murad, Assistant Professor at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton uh, University and a Senior Associate at the Global Migration Lab at Monk School. And finally, we'll, uh, we'll uh, hear from Craig Damien Smith, Senior Research Associate at the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration Program at Ryerson, um, and a research affiliate at the Center for Refugee Studies at York University, and finally also a Senior Associate at the Global Migration Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. So without further ado, uh, we'll turn it over to our speakers. We'll try to go for about 30 minutes, leaving what looks like about 25 minutes for question and answer and, and a broader discussion. Uh, feel free when the time comes to uh, pose your question in the Q using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So over to you, Professor Hansen. Great, thank you, Ed, and thank you to my uh, panelists. I want to say something about the uh, Ukrainian refugee situation in a comparative global context, and then something about what the EU is doing. And my jumping off point is the superlatives that we're hearing at the moment. That this is the greatest refugee crisis this century, the greatest refugee crisis in, in Europe, and so forth. And that is technically true in that Ukrainians have fled in faster numbers than any other refugee crisis this century. Two million in one week, one week, over two million, sorry, in two weeks, uh, is the fastest rate. However, when we compare this refugee crisis to others, what stands out is not its singularity, but what it shares in common with other refugee crises. Before I begin that, though, I think we need to start with definitions. Because the term refugee is thrown around loosely, people talk about Ukrainian refugees coming to Canada, Things are in flux at the moment, but as of a few days ago, the government was not willing to open the door to a single Ukrainian refugee. They rather opened migration channels. As I say, this is in flux, and my colleague Craig will speak to that. A refugee under the 1951 convention is one facing a well-founded fear of persecution. Now, that fact has opened a conservative counterattack against the very idea of refugees, because what anti-refugee Tories love to point out is that many refugees are not fleeing 
political persecution in the way that Jews in the 1930s were or Soviet dissidents in the 1960s or 1970s. Technically true. But what's almost more important for understanding refugees is not the well-founded fear of persecution, but rather the duty of non refoulement or the duty not to return someone to a country where they face harm, cruel, inhum inhumane punishment, torture, but keep it at harm for the moment. So a refugee under Article 33 of the convention and under multiple other supporting conventions, a refugee is one who has a well-founded fear of harm. And this is important because while bullets and bombs do not as such persecute, they certainly harm. And this understanding of the refugee actually better fits facts on the ground because the vast majority of refugees are not fleeing persecution, but rather war. So we look, if we look at the top five refugee producing countries, Syria, almost 7 million refugees, Venezuela, 5.5, Afghanistan, almost three, South Sudan, 2.2, and Myanmar, 1.1. In every case, except Myanmar, those refugees are fleeing war. And that's about two thirds of the global population of, of refugees. Ukraine, Ukrainians will soon, will soon join them. Now, we've heard a great deal um, about Polish, Hungarian, Romanian, Slovakian generosity, and generous they have been. And we've heard a great deal about the hypocrisy of those countries in that they refuse to accept Syrian refugees and hypocritical they probably were. All of this is a bit exaggerated, however, because in all cases of a mass influx, a mass refugee outflow, refugees flee first to the country. Well, first they flee internally and then they flee to the country where they are safest. And that is the country next door. And in almost all cases, neighboring countries accept refugees. For all the anti-refugee rhetoric, the hate speech, occasional horrendous attacks against refugees, most countries respect the non refoulement principle or the non-return principle. And the reason for that is logical. When hundreds of thousands of refugees are coming immediately towards your borders, you have two choices, open the border or open fire. And almost all countries open the border. Syria is not next to Germany, but this is the choice that Angela Merkel faced in 2015, open the border or open fire. And it's for that reason, and not because of some sort of girlish naivete as misogynist right-wing commentators would have us believe that it led her and the rest of her government to open the door to Syrians. Now, a couple of comments on the EU, I'm also almost out of time. The EU has not granted refugee status to Ukrainians. It is not within the power of the EU to grant refugee status because despite what Brexiters will tell you, responsibility for jurisdiction over refugees, migration, citizenship, that rests with the member states. What the EU did, because it had to act quickly, was it dug out a directive from 2001, which had been created to cope with the mass influx of Kosovo refugees, and that grants temporary protection. It's a directive, which is technically binding, but if the states wanted to ignore it, they could. Temporary protection for one year, extendable to three. And there's lots of real rights in there, right to education, right to work, right to travel, and so on, but it can be withdrawn at any time. So the Syrians who went to Germany, 75% of whom got full refugee status, had a much more secure status, like citizenship, except the right to vote. So what happens next? Well, I very much hope that Ukraine wins this war, that Russian troops withdraw, and that the Ukrainians go home. But precedent is not encouraging. Uh, my colleague and my friend, Alexander T. Alinikov at the New School, deputy head of UNHCR for many years, uh, he calls this Newton's fourth law. 
displaced, populations remain displaced. If that turns out to be the case with Ukrainians, then the countries that they're in now should integrate them, grant them a permanent right to remain, all the rights of citizenship, and indeed citizenship itself. Hannah Arendt, a refugee herself, made the famous claim that citizenship is a right to have rights. This is actually wrong. You can have all manner of rights without citizenship. Think of being a permanent resident in this country, but there is nothing better than citizenship for refugees and for everyone else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hansen, and thank you for sticking to the time. Um, it helps to uh, move our discussion forward. I'm sure we'll have a lot of great, uh, great questions at the end. Over to Professor Lama Murad. So much, Ed, and, and thank you, Randall. Um, sorry, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. There's a bit of background noise, but I'm not sure where it's coming from. Um, but I want sorry, to build. Sorry, Lama, just yeah. give me a second. If if, if your mic is not muted, please go ahead and mute it. Thank you very much. Anyone in the audience? Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, so I, I want to preface by saying that, you know, I'm the, uh, you know, I, ha I haven't conducted any research in Europe and I'm not an expert on Europe or Ukraine or Russia. So I'll be really speaking from a comparative perspective here on my own research on, on, on refugee movements in the Middle East and host state responses. So I really want to build and echo uh, Randall's point about the importance of acknowledging that we, you know, we really shouldn't be that surprised that neighboring countries open their borders to refugees. You know, we see this time and again in the global south, which is where I, I do my research primarily. And in particular, in, in my research on Lebanon's response to the arrival of Syrians, it was clear that a confluence of factors, including political gridlock, but also, uh, you know, expectations about uh, what, you know, what would happen in Syria and the, the different political uh, ideological links with different parties in Lebanon, uh, shaped the early response uh, and the decision to not close the border to Syrians fleeing violence. And I think something like that uh, helps us understand also the Central Europeans' response. And similar decisions um, were made also in Turkey and Jordan. But building on this, I'd like to also emphasize that we shouldn't mistake this early openness uh, to mean that these borders that we're now seeing as relatively open to Ukrainians as uh, necessarily something that we'll see in the longer term, or that this warm welcome won't get much more tepid, at the very least, uh, particularly if this war drags on, or if the balance of the conflict tips uh, more clearly in favor of uh, the Russian regime. And this was important um, in, in what I saw in Lebanon, where strong expectations on the part of certain political parties and factions in the country that Assad would fall within months, for example, really fueled a greater openness, even at a local level among uh, local communities and municipalities that really warmly welcomed Syrians in the early days. But as the conflict dragged on, uh, greater tensions emerged, even in areas that were previously very, very supportive, even in, in, in one municipality, for instance, that I conducted research in that had flown the flag of the Free Syrian Army, for instance, you know, very, very strong support. But I anticipate in, in many ways that a similar dynamic is at play here and where there's a lot of hope among uh, Western countries and, and neighboring countries to Ukraine about the potential for sanctions and other actions to weaken Putin's regime, or at least their ability to, to maintain war in Ukraine. And as I said, while I'm not an expert on, on this region at all, I, I, I know that many scholars doubt that this will necessarily be a fast and, and quick uh, war and so we should you know already be thinking about what the medium to long term looks like for for these displaced populations and in addition you know while as Randall mentioned reports of other migrants particularly racialized migrants like Nigerians South Asians and more broadly nationals from other countries um, facing discrimination and greater difficulty crossing those borders and that should definitely be be called out and and criticized this is also not something that's unique to Europe uh, in fact, at the same time that Lebanon kept its borders open for Syrians, it was already severely restricting access for Palestinian refugees from Syria who were fleeing the same violence. 
And similarly, Jordan in 2013, as it was keeping its border open for Syrians, had banned entry for Palestinians. So rather than, I think, exceptionalizing the European context for the kind of discriminatory policies that we're seeing, it should really lead us more broadly to ask questions when we hear about open border policies everywhere and to, to think about open for whom and under what conditions. And although there's been a lot of talk um, of, of the double standard of, and the international on, regarding the international outcry and the response uh, that Russia's bombing of, of Ukraine is, is garnering versus Russia's bombing of Syria previously. And some of that, again, is undoubtedly warranted. And it would have been you know, really uh, great to see some of this international outcry much more um, powerfully in the case of, of Russia's targeting of, of Syrians as well. But I, I, I think you know, an emphasis, too much of an emphasis on this or centering this at the moment really misses the mark. And, and I think even more importantly, it ignores what Syrians themselves and Syrian refugees and Syrian opposition figures and activists have been voicing, which is actually a great deal of solidarity with Ukrainians. And even, um, you know, with, with people in, 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 uh, in Syria today, you know, painting graffitis in support of Ukrainians and, and, and voicing their, their empathy, but also the ways in which they see their struggles as intertwined. So we know in many ways, you know, that Russia tested a lot of the techniques and, and even the technologies that it's using today in Ukraine in Syria. Some of these are actual military technologies, but all of these, some of these are some of the horrific tactics that we here talked about, you know, over the last few days, especially, such as attacks on hospitals and the targeting of humanitarian corridors. So um, according to observers, uh, you know, uh, Russia uh, systematically targeted, you know, over 200 Syrian hospitals in its um, attacks in, in Syria. So, even when we talk uh, here about, for instance, the absurdity of so-called humanitarian corridors passing through Russia, this was something that we saw happening in Syria with humanitarian corridors leading to regime held areas and forcing in many ways, uh, internally displaced populations to go to regime held areas from opposition territories. So, you know, again, I think what, you know, I take my cue and, and I'm not Syrian myself, but I take my cue from Syrians on this. In, in thinking about the ways that, that Syrians have been uh, very vocal in the support for Ukrainians and seeing that in, in may, perhaps an overly hopeful um, take, but that uh, the kind of pressure that we're seeing today might lead us to reflect back on the shortcomings of the response in Syria, rather than sort of seeing this as a, as a sort of competitive uh, issue. And I think it's really important to also note that Syrians, like the White Helmets, for example, have, have come out very uh, publicly in offering even their support uh, technically and in terms of personnel to uh, Ukrainians, but also offering critical advice from their experience. So for instance, recommending that, um, that Ukrainians don't share GPS locations of hospitals with the United Nations, because that would mean that Russia would have access to it. So, I think this is, you know, to, to sort of uh, nuance and, and, and uh, add, I think, those, a particular layer to, to some of the, the critiques that we've been hearing. And then just one, one final remark on the potential impact of this ongoing war on other uh, vulnerable and, and humanitarian situations and future potential for future migration flows. It's important to note that the Middle East uh, as a region is one of the most heavily dependent on uh, Ukrainian and Russian wheat. And we, you know, many countries like Egypt and Lebanon, for example, are incredibly dependent on their food security from these countries. Uh, for instance, in, in the case I know best in Lebanon, it's upwards of 90% of the country's wheat and, and cooking oil supply that is provided by Ukraine and, and Russia. And so it's important that, you know, and in the case of Lebanon, considering the economic situation at the moment, it only has one month's wheat reserves left. This is due to a, a number of factors. But so particularly as European states and the United States and Canada, I think are, are importantly and, and justifiably perhaps focused on what's happening in Europe and Ukraine, it's important that we not lose sight of the humanitarian situation in many of these countries who are also 
uh, major hosts of refugees and migrants worldwide. So if we care about the humanitarian consequences of this war writ large, we should also really be uh, ensure that we don't lose sight of some of these downstream effects and um, the potential that they have uh, for, for exacerbating uh, humanitarian situations uh, worldwide. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Professor Murad, um, for those uh, important comparisons and, and the reminders of the various kinds of uh, global connections that are playing themselves out in real time before our eyes. Um, over to Dr. Smith. Craig. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so I was asked to talk about the Canadian response and, and what Canadians uh, can do. So I'll start with the basics. So last week, the government announced that it's going to eliminate visa requirements for Ukrainians uh, to allow easier travel to Canada, as well as uh, easier family class or what they call family reunification programs towards permanent residency and allow those in Canada uh, to extend their stay and also to uh, put stays on deportations uh, for Ukrainians. So this new Canada-Ukraine authorization for emergency travel will be waive all the visa requirements and allow temporary residency for two years and allow people to work immediately and access services, et cetera. Um, after that two years, we don't know yet, that's open for speculation, but I would echo Randall's comments that if people are arriving and coming to Canada and staying for two years, it's very likely the case that uh, they wouldn't go back again. And then after that, there might be some, uh, you know, like a, a blanket, a blanket change in their status, or humanitarian and compassionate leave to stay, or some may apply for asylum. Uh, we don't know yet. Um, the policy is noteworthy for a few reasons. So, unlike the Syrian refugee crisis that so gripped uh, Canadians' attention, it means that civil society groups and universities and businesses and faith-based organizations, etc., won't have to mobilize to form private sponsorship groups to support Ukrainians. Um, and by that, I mean that Canadians uh, working to receive displaced Ukrainians won't be legally liable, nor will it cost tens of thousands of dollars to try to help people bring here. Uh, they'll arrive, they'll be supported by communities, families, and a range of specialized organizations. Uh, and without a doubt, mutual aid and donation programs will develop like they always do with these kinds of high profile emergencies. Uh, in Canada, just like they do uh, in Europe and the Middle East and basically everywhere else. Um, and it's important to note also that this is probably a good thing for Canada's refugee resettlement system. Um, the settlement and integration agencies uh, more broadly won't be put in another crisis situation uh, because of political decisions. Um, and it also means that at least for these first cohorts, uh, they won't enter the queue of people um, waiting for resettlement in Canada. Uh, second, um, Canada is a global leader in using visa restrictions to control the numbers and types of people who arrive in Canada. And it's particularly adept at metering visa approval rate to prevent the arrival of those who would be granted asylum uh, if, they, if they requested it. So, as an example, it's virtually impossible to get a visitor visa to Canada if you're from Syria or Afghanistan or Yemen, um, any of these countries that uh, we also call the worst humanitarian disasters uh, and from which people basically have no choice but to stay in the region of origin. According to Minister Fraser and Prime Minister Trudeau, there's going to be no limits, that's the quote, no limits on the number of Ukrainians who can apply. So the Canadian immigration and asylum systems are all about limits, caps, and targets. No immigration minister that I'm aware of or prime minister has ever said anything like, we'll accept as many people who want to apply, no caps, no costs, no red tape. But this is, this is uh, in, I think, unprecedented, maybe not. Maybe I'm just not old enough. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Basically, we have to see how it plays out in practice. Um, so now, now the critical part. Um, I think it's pretty important to put this in comparative perspective in the way that Canada is responding um, and ask some uh, political questions. So Canada has yet to resettle uh, the promised 40,000 refugees uh, from Afghanistan, which is a situation in which Canada played a major role for many years. 
Uh, they dragged the bureaucracy and the government has dragged their feet on that resettlement and continue to do so. And they're very steadfast about the rules. Um, so to illustrate this, I've been personally involved in a situation with a friend who was originally an Afghan journalist, claimed asylum in Canada several years ago. When Kabul fell, his three adult siblings were evacuated uh, to the Netherlands the day before the evacuation flights ceased. They've never previously traveled abroad. They don't speak Dutch. They don't know anyone or have any family there. They have a brother who's very well settled in Canada. He's got a large house, a beautiful young family. They collected the money for private sponsorship, uh, engaged what's called a sponsorship agreement holder to include them in their quota. And then here and with other colleagues, uh, uh, refugee lawyers, high profile journalists, et cetera, working in the Netherlands, we, we worked all the contacts that we had at the political level in uh, the immigration bureaucracy. The Dutch authorities were ready to play ball to have them come to Canada and, and have this chance to, to join their family member who's here after this chaotic evacuation. The response from senior civil servants and people at the political level is that because they have access to what's called a durable solution in Europe, so they can claim asylum and get residency in Europe, because Europe is considered a safe place for refugees, that they're not eligible for resettlement to Canada. That's it. That's the end of the story. They're not coming here. So they're going to spend three years in this pretty inhumane Dutch asylum procedures and then who knows how many years after that before they can see their brother again. That's the answer uh, from the Canadian government about resettling refugees from Europe. So whatever the number of Ukrainians who arrived to Canada turns out to be, we have to ask whether or not this is an act of what, what's called uh, in, the, in the global refugee governance jargon, what's called responsibility sharing with Europe. Or is it a play of Canadian domestic politics or is a little bit of both of that? Um, if it's about responsibility sharing, then why Ukrainians now and not the hundreds of thousands of other asylum seekers who arrive in Europe every year, the tens of thousands of people who are quite obviously refugees who are in camps in Greece, why not conduct refugee status determination procedures in places like Calais or Sicily or Malta? These are ways that Canada might use uh, this precedent of Ukraine um, to maybe play a better role in responsibility sharing for frontline states that are experiencing refugee emergencies. Um, and two kind of final points here. One, I don't think it's at all cynical to highlight the fact that Canada has a large and politically active and well-connected Ukrainian diaspora. Uh, that's how policy lobbying works. Um, and two, no one who studies Canadian immigration and refugee policy uh, thinks that it is or ever has been purely altruistic. That's not how Canadian immigration policy works. So I'm not going to claim that offering protection and path to citizenship for Ukrainians in Canada is a bad thing. Very clearly it's not. Um, but we should also note that there's no political risk for the government in doing this, and there's only the potential for political gain. It's absolutely true, and, and we should push this fact, that uh, certain areas of the world shouldn't have to shoulder a disproportionate humanitarian responsibility. But that's the state of affairs with, with uh, global displacement. More than 85% of the world's refugees are hosted in the poorest regions close to their countries of origin, because that's the way we've set up the system. Most people don't get to be resettled. Less than 1% of the close to 30 million now refugees in the world are resettled every year. Um, and we should also focus on the fact that yes, people should be able to access their communities abroad and they shouldn't be isolated if Canada can do something about it and is willing to step up. Um, having a strong reception system, strong social networks is crucial for people's long-term integration uh, and general well-being. Um, and I'll just I'll close looping it back to Randall's comments that th this this new this new policy um, seems to be somewhat like the EU's temporary protection directive, uh, with one very notable difference. Um, 
Canada's policy is not geared towards victims of the aggression and war crimes occurring in Ukraine. It's geared towards Ukrainians fleeing the war of aggression in Ukraine. And it ex explicitly excludes other groups like refugees who were already in Ukraine who had to go over the border, third country nationals, and many of these people who are uh, likely going to be even more vulnerable uh, than they were previously. The EU Temporary Protection Directive applies to third country nationals. So people who were living in Ukraine, who were victims of the war, who are now displaced internationally. Canada, just like with my friend uh, who's Afghan, who's, whose siblings are, are in the Netherlands said, no, it's, it's safe enough for you in Europe. So why isn't it safe enough there for Ukraine? That's an open question. And we've also seen that uh, people who are not white are being treated very differently on the, on the border with Poland. Uh, it's a relatively small number, uh, but it's something that we should also pay attention to and think about when uh, we're deciding who gets to come uh, to Canada and who's got to stay in a country like uh, Poland. Thanks. Great. Thanks to to all our speakers. Um, you've, you've covered a, a ton of ground. Obviously, we'll have uh, we'll have questions. I've seen a few in the Q and A uh, function. Please feel free to use that. We won't be taking questions orally. So if you have a question, make sure to type it to the bottom of your screen uh, under Q and A. Uh, feel free to type it, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Just one quick thing that may may be obvious to those watching: there is only one Randall Hansen. In reality, even though you may see four or five different uh, Randall Hansons um, uh, in front of you, little boxes on your screen, that had to do with a mistakenly shared link. And so um, uh, just keep in mind that there's only one Randall Hanson and he's the one with his camera on, the rest are not. Um, so please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A uh, section. Let me, let me take a question from, that I've already seen and then add my own to it. So I, Let's let's talk a little bit more about some of the anticipated. It's early times, but anticipated sort of knock-on effects in terms of um, global connections. So, Lama, you already talked about the the centrality of grain and and, and cooking oil. Um, what other kinds of things? And maybe just thinking by historical analogies from other uh, from other cases, can we anticipate in terms of changing configurations of of geopolitics, specifically from refugee refugee flows? That's an open question to, to anybody. Um, second question, and, and this is my own question, and, and maybe it's a little more to, to Craig, uh, uh, I guess purely out of ignorance, but uh, well, not entirely out of ignorance, out of, you know, coming from a, a space of anecdotal evidence. It seems that even in the best of times, Canada's ability to process, um, uh, uh, you know, even ordinary visas, right, is, is somewhat limited. And I wonder to what extent some of the things that you're seeing is driven by the the limited capacity of the of this um, of our of our government to process uh, and the and the and sort of being overwhelmed and and looking for any reason to deny applicants unfortunately or if that's not if that's not part of the story that's fine too I'd love to hear that but I guess the more general question is does Canada have the capacity does this bureaucracy have the capacity to process um, all that it needs to process? So those two questions. Who wants to start with the uh, with the first? Wow. Yeah, I'm happy to to take a first um, shot at it. Um, so I, actually, one thing that I think is really important and something that I'll be watching is, uh, in addition to 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 what I talked about in terms of uh, sort of onward displacement and other migration flows. Um, I think what happens in Ukraine um, and what is happening in Ukraine, not just sort of in the future, but what is currently happening will inevitably and is already impacting uh, geopolitical configurations in the Middle East. Uh, I think in important ways in Syria, very directly, obviously, because as Russia's uh, military and economic resources become more stretched and is obviously you know, focused on, on its immediate uh, region, there will undoubtedly be effects on the Syrian regime and its allies as well in the region in, in, in terms of support and in terms of actual, you know, military uh, sustaining, uh, you know, I, I 
it's it's not you know I don't predict that this will necessarily be you know what brings on uh, the toppling of of, of uh, the Assad regime or anything like that. You know, again, we'll we'll see what happens. But uh, you know, I was reading this morning already that uh, Russia is is also bringing in Syrian fighters from from Syria, and, and I think that's something that you know we've been seeing. Obviously, the the international legion that Ukraine has has also mobilized, and and we're going to be seeing more and more of that. I think on both sides. So I think it's really important that if that happens, if you know Syrians, if we find Syrians fighting alongside Russians in in Syria. I, sorry, in Ukraine, um, I hope that it's also really um, important that Ukrainians also continue to remember that Syrians have also been victims of the same configuration of regimes and that this kind of solidarity um, with Ukrainians has been um, a very important part of the Syrian response as well. Great, uh, Randall. Great, thanks. Yeah, I just actually want to pick up on one of a uh, comment that Lama made already because in a sense rising food prices will have other not only humanitarian but quite possibly political and even geopolitical consequences. We often forget that the, Ar the Arab Spring started not with a cry for political but for economic freedom. It started with bread riots which have been for decades hugely destabilizing for the Middle East. So that's a space to watch. The second is we're back in, you know, we're back in the 1970s without the bell bottoms, which is to say that we are coming out of a period in which inflation because of COVID this time, Vietnam in the 60s, has been creeping up to dangerous levels. And we now have a massive oil shock, partly uh, an oil shock created by a Soviet invasion, sorry, a Russian invasion of Ukraine which seems remarkably like the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. That's the link I was trying to make. So this could be really quite devastating for uh, the world economy. That's it. Okay. Uh, I was gonna say one, one interesting point on the geopolitical configuration. I'm currently in the Southern US, uh, slowly making my way back to Toronto. Gas prices have basically doubled uh, as, as I've, I've been six bucks a gallon in, in California, which was, that's a lot. Um, one interesting thing here is that the geopolitical reconfigurations, and this has nothing to do with refugees per se, um, except for the next largest refugee, or I guess now the you know, second largest refugee crisis, which is Venezuelans, uh, where the Biden administration now is bargaining with uh, the Maduro government to uh, drop sanctions and start importing Venezuelan oil, uh, which is uh, an interesting uh, geopolitical context. But also the domestic impacts of increased oil prices and commodity prices um, seem to be able to swing uh, either way politically uh, in, in the West. Uh, so that's also something to watch and pay attention to. Um, sorry, but the second question was about, oh yes, right. Yeah, the, the Canadian, the, the capacity for the civil servants in, in Canada um, to process visa applications. I mean, I don't need to tell um, anyone on this, uh, on this call who's not from Canada originally or has family who they've tried to bring to Canada, et cetera. Uh, that is an incredibly long and frustrating process and seems and is incredibly opaque as well. But it's also the case that when the, the current government um, made an election promise to resettle an additional 25,000 Syrian refugees, um, they were able to field um, consular officials in Lebanon and Turkey and Jordan um, and get people on planes with the cooperation of UNHCR and the IOM to arrive in Canada. It was a bit of a gong show once they arrived here and it was up to civil society to step up and and help make sure they were housed and integrated properly. Um, but Canada in emergency situations can do these things. And yes, you're right, by waving all of the, by waving, basically cutting all of the red tape, uh, they're definitely making the job easier for themselves. And I don't, I don't buy into this, uh, into the NDP argument that, um, although that's, you know, people who know me know where I'm at, um, that the, uh, that, that cutting all of the um, security preclearances and background checks also is a necessary part of this. Um, 
two weeks to roll out new immigration policies is lightning uh, speed and and uh, and yeah, I, I I think that the, I think that the grounds for criticism are uh, this yeah, people should. In terms of Canada, people should should uh, should recognize that uh, the Ukrainians are quite quite lucky to be getting the attention that they are compared to other uh, avenues for access in Canada. Great. And uh, I mean, you mentioned NGOs as a question. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned the Syrian um, resettlement effort, and there we saw a whole bunch of different kinds of partnerships, um, private public maybe combinations i'm not an expert in this area but it struck me that it was particularly sort of vibrant cross um across public and private uh um uh, areas um, and also probably provincial as well i wonder if do we have any sense of uh, the mobilization of 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 private groups perhaps most prominently ukrainians uh ukrainian groups but any coordinated efforts that we're starting to see em emerge and anything that we can say about the likelihood that this will be, you know, a successful uh, effort in terms of integrating, welcoming, integrating, and, and, um, uh, and um, setting, you know, new refugees along a good life path. So that's a first sort of question, maybe for Craig or maybe for others. Um, a second question is, of course, in a way, the, the flip side of the welcome reception that we all love to talk about, at least in the Syrian case, uh, it seems to me, could be wrong here again, I'm not the expert, but it seems to me clear that, um, the, that there was a backlash, at least among uh, a different segment of populations in Europe, or at least it added to a right-wing critique, uh, sort of a, it put wind in the sails of right-wing populism. Uh, again, that's not the only thing driving populism, but do we see a whiff of that um, at all here, or is is that not simply not happening? And I guess in which in which case we would ask, what's that, what's the story there? Uh, let me go with Randall first, and then and then to Craig. Great, thanks. I'll leave the NGOs in Canada for Craig, but that is kind of bog standard in all massive influxes where you have large refugee populations that if they're going to be successfully integrated, NGOs play as much as a role, if not more than the state. And that moves on to the, the backlash point. It's too early to tell. We are effectively September, August, 2015, in that same sort of space. That's where we were with Syrians. This is basically where we are with Ukrainians, large numbers immediately arriving. And against a historical hard lift, Twitter sphere that is saying again and again and again, Lama touched on that, oh, we're only emitting them because they're blonde and blue-eyed and white. I've been trolling them with Guardian headlines from 2015, which showed exactly the same warm wel welcome in Munich station, where hundreds of thousands of people were arriving in Germany and they were extremely warmly welcomed. There was a backlash, that mass arrival reconfigured the party system in Europe and gave the hard right a good shot in the arm, but it did not undermine the welcoming culture. This is what's often forgotten. The NGOs were active before and after the horrendous uh, New Year's Eve attacks in Cologne Station, attacks that were not undertaken by Syrians, but rather in the main by North African petty criminals, had nothing, petty criminals that had nothing to do with refugees. The NGOs continued. Um, and this time around, the populists are going to have a hell of a, lot, a lot, uh, harder time because they um, attach their star very explicitly to Vladimir Putin. So this has been the most devastating blow for right-wing populists in Europe and hopefully for Donald Trump, but that's another story. So I don't predict the same uh, backlash this time around. One last point, because I two last points, because I want to get them in. Uh, Lama's point on the, uh, hu um, the humanitarian corridors and what the Russians are doing. This is almost out of the Red Army playbook. Professor Schatz, you're an expert Af on Afghanistan. That's precisely what the, the Soviets did, is bomb the hell out of the countryside to try and force Afghans into the cities because the cities were under Soviet control. Last point, I'll let it go to what Craig said on Canadian hypocrisy. I mean, this is right out of a Canadian playbook, the treatment of Afghans and Syrians. Uh, the Canadian government prances around the world 
benefiting from this reputation for great Canadian liberalism, these sanctimonious intellectuals who go to one conference after another saying, you who've just accepted 400,000 low-skilled immigrants need to become just a little bit more Canadian, have an official multicultural policy, and all your problems will go away. This is utter nonsense from a country that rigidly controls immigration and which is one of the least generous globally in its acceptance of refugees. Generous to the ones who get here, but ungenerous with numbers. Germany has already taken in 80,000 refugees and it's not a contiguous country. Great. Um, Craig, over to you. Did you have something? There's just, there, there's an interesting trend uh, in terms of political backlash. So we often think of uh, this as, as like uh, far right backlash against refugees leading up to what increasingly became obvious was going to be a Russian war of aggression and territorial annexation in Ukraine. Friends of mine, colleagues on who are, I align with politically in general, <clears throat> who we could just call like left progressive, parroting uh, basically Russian propaganda that Canada, because of uh, one brigade that was that 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 the that Zelensky was um, uh, essentially trying to disempower, and parties that were down to one seat in the Ukrainian government, um, that Canada was like funding Nazi militias, um, and the other the other line from that that you see from again people on the left in Canada is that. Uh, it's NATO's fault because NATO, therefore, Putin had to invade and, and uh, launch this war of aggression in Ukraine. So there's a, in Canada, at least, there's a, there's a strange confluence of, yeah, pro, I don't know, pro-Putin sentiment uh, and propaganda. And it will be interesting to see whether those people just shut their mouths now or whether that plays out in the way that they, um, that they talk about uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, coming to Canada as well. Great. Um, Lama, did you want to add anything on these scores? Well, I guess just on, on this last point that, that uh, Craig was making, I, again, you know, uh, not to uh, center Syria in this uh, too much, but it, this is also not entirely surprising and something we saw uh, in uh, sort of the Western left's response to Syria as well and has been criticized heavily by Syrian activists. I actually saw recently that um, a Syrian activist post something to the effect of, uh, you know, that those that essentially the, the Nazi uh, sort of uh, militias in Ukraine are the, the equivalent of, of uh, IS uh, as the boogeyman in, in Syria, right? This sort of sense that if you arm or if you support the Syrian opposition, you're by definition sort of also providing support to Islamists and not realizing how sort of that also fed into uh, its own, you know, into regime uh, propaganda around this and also uh, sort of fed that dynamic uh, within Syria itself. Yeah, and of course, on the on the ground, we can. It's possible for two things to be true at once. You can, you know, Ukraine can have, as most countries um, around the globe these days have a far right problem, uh, and yet, um, and yet, that's not really the main story here. So we don't need to buy into um, a couple of, of questions um, that have come up. One in in various ways, you know, the our topic is the Ukraine is or Ukrainian refugees, but I wonder. At some point, do we start to talk about um, Russians themselves who are speaking out against the war and the kinds of predicament we've seen? I don't know what the numbers are, but we've seen Russians, particularly those of means, but not only, right? Um, you know, fleeing. These are, you know, the last vestiges of independent journalism. These are people who, who have left. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any uh, effort made, or at least there wasn't. Now it may have changed to, to prevent these people from leaving. But at what point do we begin to, to shift the conversation to talk about others um, who have been um, uh, affected by uh, this war of aggression? And then another question, not particularly related, but I think 
I think worth uh, worth asking. Maybe this is just more of a clarification for uh, for Craig. Um, you mentioned that Canada is turning away some refugees and third country nationals already in Ukraine. So I guess refugees from other from other states. Where are they going? Do we know what's happening um, to these to these people? Um, are they simply stuck in the war? Um, uh, are other countries stepping up? Um, any any sense on that on that front? Who wants to? Lama, do you want to start with any? No, any thoughts on? Okay, who wants to start with any thoughts about uh, others speaking up against the war who may run afoul of Vladimir Putin's regime? Randall. Yeah, um, I mean, and I think I think I saw a question in the chat about about possible Russian refugees, so we could take it in, in that context. Um, and there's two issues here. One isn't a refugee issue. Uh, one is a simple issue of, of those Russians, professors and others who are speaking out, and I think who shouldn't be forgotten because they are staggeringly brave people in the context of uh, the institution of martial law, threats of 15 years in prison, this utter brutal dictator. And as you know, uh, Professor Schatz, we've taken what I think is the right decision at the center not to boycott relations with Russian professors, and if there are people in Russia who can explain to us what is happening, they have our support. Uh, the broader issue of refu Russian refugees, there's going people moving out, there's two types. Those with money and connections are already moving out. Um, some heading to Dubai, um, others if they can get around sanctions, they have dual passports elsewhere in Europe. If that becomes a larger outflow, entirely depends on how this war rolls out. Um, if the sanctions lead to total economic collapse in Russia, then yes, we could be looking at a wave of Russian refugees. Now, uh, if we look at the, think of the historical precedents, we didn't get massive numbers in the early 90s in the way that we expected this great, great wave out. But other precedents is refugees flow from war and collapse. And I just want to add, tack on something uh, to that because I doubt we'll have time to come back to it. Uh, the demonization of um, that real but small minority of far-right elements as terrorists, the demonization of, uh, and there were some terrorists, but the demonization of huge swathes of Syrian opposition forces to Sadat as terrorists, all of this is the stepchild, the heritage of the greatest U.S. foreign policy disaster of the, of this century, probably the last two centuries, which is to say the invasion of Iraq, which did two things, created millions of refugees itself as a consequence of war, destabilized regimes in the Middle East with important knock-on effects, and gave the dictators of the world, thank you very much, President Bush, a rhetorical tool to attack regime critics. They are always terrorists. And when they're terrorists, you can do, as the Americans did in Guantanamo Bay, whatever the hell you want with them. And we saw that in Beijing, we saw that in Damascus, and we're seeing that in Moscow. Um, Lama, any thoughts? I'm just uh, try trying to be read body language over Zoom. <laughs> um, Craig, I see you're unmuted. Or, sorry, Lama, go ahead. Go ahead if you've got something. Uh, um, I feel like I've been talking more than you. Do you want to make a comment? No. Um, so Canada has for for years been uh, accepting refugees uh, from asylum seekers, refugees from Russia. Um, a lot of queer people, uh, political dissidents, um, and there's been there have been uh, some like. What the, what the term clandestine type of evacuations from Russia of people uh, who are politically vulnerable um, and these as Randall open with meet, meet the the precise definition of a refugee they're, they're being persecuted by their government for their political opinions or their um, or their identification with a specific social group etc so I think that we should you know as people who who, who work around this um there are like a number of ngos that have helped with this uh, with with evacuating uh, gay men from from chechnya rainbow railroad uh was was really crucial there cost the immigrant services uh received them in toronto so 
Canada has this like very well developed wraparound thing that we call the settlement sector. Um, and I guess to end off with, like with a, with a, with a note of what people can do, rather than if you're in Canada and you want to help out, other than donating money abroad, pay attention to to the types of calls for volunteerism and support that the established uh, agencies um, and civil society groups are asking for. Uh, avoid, I would say, the uh, urge to rush over to the to a local shelter and drop off a bunch of winter clothes and pots and pans. Uh, that's generally not helpful, um, but there there are a lot of avenues uh, for help um, in Canada, and and you just need to look around a little bit and see what people need. Um, yeah, I think that's it. That's, uh, that's very helpful and practical. And I know it connects to uh, a lot of the reasons why people tune in here. It's just uh, they want to they wanna figure out the way in which they can be, become uh, useful um, uh, and, and, and what specifically that would look like. We have about two minutes left. So what I'd like to do is uh, just see if anyone has any last thoughts. Um, I was going to open this, this line of, of thinking, Craig, sort of what can people do? So maybe anybody has any additional uh, comments on that on that score, Craig. Specifically, I'd love to hear from you about where to look um, because you know people like me don't uh, don't have them at the tip of our tongue or in our Rolodex. So we may, a couple of quick suggestions, practical ones would be or specific ones would be would be useful. But then I'd love to hear from each of the rest of you. Maybe one point. That's probably all we have time for each on what your you know as analysts, right? Um, what you are paying attention to over the next week or two that you think will be particularly consequential as this uh, continues to develop. Um, who wants to get us started? We're going to do everybody, so you'll have your turn, everyone. Lama should go first. Okay, Lama, you've been volunteered. Are you ready? All right, no pressure. I mean, I'll, I'll just want to say one, one small thing uh, on the on the Russian um the potential for Russian refugees. I think just as an observer, uh, I must say, I think one of the things that has been really uh, concerning to me, in addition to all of the things we've talked about, has been sort of rapid um, escalation, I think, in, in sort of just general anti-Russian sentiment that I've, I've that you, you do see. I think it's sometimes well-intentioned actions. But for instance, you know, hearing about and again, it, it, there may be, but the, you know, the pianist in Montreal in the symphony orchestra being, you know, there are, there is, I think, a, a danger in too uh, rapidly sort of, and, and, and in a dangerous way to sort of uh, target Russians as a, as a community in this, especially when people are, you know, vocally expressing, um, in, as was the case with this, this young artist, um, opposition to the war, um, because of, the real costs that are also associated with making those kinds of statements. Uh, I think we underestimate, uh, you know, having, you know, living in democracies, the costs that people bear for making statements like that uh, and for their families back home. And, and I think, you know, as, as a scholar of, of, of the Middle East and of many authoritarian contexts, um, it, which has many authoritarian contexts, I think we're, you know, it, that's something that is very, very obvious to, to, to those of us from the region. Um, but in terms of of, of what I'm uh, watching, I think for me, um, I'm I'm really interested in seeing you know uh, uh, the the sort of response of other European countries as well, particularly the UK, for example, who which seems to still be very strongly uh, taking a stance against sort of opening up uh, uh, you know refugee uh, status or or sort of bringing in uh, Ukrainians under that status. I think it was. It was only, you know, maybe in the still less than 100, right? I think something like that. Uh, Ukrainians that have been brought in very, very small numbers. And I think it's, it, it, it to me, it's very, very important to sort of, again, situate this uh, in a broader context and sort of de-exceptionalize both uh, migration movements in the global south, as well as those in the global north um, as being part and parcel of, of, of a, a global system. Great, um, very important uh, considerations. Uh, Craig, please. Uh, two things. Um, one is just echoing uh, Lama's statement there. And the one thing that I've also been struck by is like, you know, whenever there's a terrorist attack anywhere in the world or in the West specifically, that it somehow becomes the job of every Muslim to speak out about it. 
uh, I don't, Russian friends that I have probably just want to keep their mouths shut and that's fine with me. Uh, and that's something that I, we should push back against that narrative that all Russians abroad should speak out against Putin. Um, secondly, uh, it'll be interesting to see how many Ukrainians actually take advantage of this. You know, when the, when you speak to civil servants and take advantage of the, of the program to come to Canada, when you speak to civil ser servants who are working on the Syrian early in the, in, in the Syrian resettlement to Canada abroad, they were scrambling around to find people to get on the planes to come to Canada. Many people were like, I don't want to go all the way there because that means I'm never coming back. Um, it's a likely, slightly different situation because of the large Ukrainian diaspora here and the social networks um, in Canada. But that's something to keep to keep an eye on, you know, while this program seems extremely open and easy right now. It may not be the case that people want to go so far away uh, so quickly. Thank you for that. And then finally over to, uh, to Randall. Yeah, I agree with those points. And again, if we look at the German statistics, 80,000 have gone to Germany, a country not very far away, uh, richer than Poland. The vast majority want to stay uh, close to home. So, and refugees generally do. I think what we have to pay attention to is the evolution of, of the war in Ukraine. Uh, the Ukrainian army has surprised almost everyone, all analysts, by being an amazing fighting machine. Uh, it is deploying with great success classic guerrilla tactics. And I see no chance of a definitive Russian victory, even if uh, Kharkiv and Kyiv fall. Uh, Ukrainian army is going to fall back. They're going to resort to urban warfare. And the Russians, passing knowledge of, of Soviet military history, are um, using old tactics. Intensive shelling of seized population. If they move into the cities, it's going to be uh, destruction by shells, block by block by block, as they move towards the center. It is going to be appallingly horrendous, even more so for civilian population. So I think we're going to see this refugee crisis roll out, continue over the years. And we have to be very guarded and that very guarded that the initial enthusiasm doesn't turn to resentment when we inevitably have competition over scarce resources, particularly in countries like Poland, Romania, Hungary that are poorer than Canada. Well, thank you all. I don't sobering comments from everybody. It's a sobering sort of uh, moment, but also a clarifying one, I think, for, for many of us. Um, let me just thank our three uh, participants. This is where we give a round of thunderous uh, applause. Uh, please join me virtually in doing so. And we look forward to uh, seeing you at, an, at another, another event at uh, the Center for European Russian Eurasian Studies, Patriotic Program, and the Global Migration Lab. Thanks again to our panelists so much. Take care, everyone. Have a great day and a, and a terrific weekend.